Welcome to Front and Center. From the political battlefields to the cooperative playing fields. Today, we have an incredible guest. It's uh, uh, amazing timing. Uh, today being Indigenous Peoples Day as well as Columbus Day. And it's perfect for the conversation that we're going to have shortly here. But before uh, we go any further, I'd like to hand it off to my partner here, Steve, to introduce our guest. Steve? Hi there, welcome. Uh, our guest today, Shauna Newcomb, I met her about three years ago at the Oregon Country Fair. I met her and her dad. Her dad, Stephen Newcomb, uh, is a world-renowned expert on what we, something we'll be talking about, the doctrine of discovery. And he is a, a, a Latin scholar, a legal scholar, and so on. And uh, it was very, very edifying to find out uh, about the papal decrees back in the 1400s that essentially gave uh, the uh, white colonials of uh, uh, conquistadors uh, full power over whoever they encountered, uh, looking at these people as less than human. Uh, and so we're here with Shauna because not only was there the domination code, but now uh, looking from the past to the future, uh, Shauna has uh, been working with something called the Reverence Code, which is a place that we want to go. So I'm very excited about talking with you today, uh, about uh, both about the past and about the future that could possibly be ours. So let's look at the Domination Code more closely. First of all, welcome, Shauna. Thank you. It's good to be here with you, Michael and Steve. Good. Um, it seems to me that because it's so ubiquitous, most people fail to recognize this domination and count uh, the exploitation of people as kind of human nature. Well, I want to know, is it? Uh, tell us more about this, uh, this domination code, what it's all about, and uh, what the implications are. Um, yes, I feel like it begins just with a different context that many people have really been accustomed to or understand, certainly within the history that has been taught through schools. And um, I just want to begin, as I usually do, and my dad usually uh, does as well, that we like to just begin by acknowledging the original peoples and nations, um, lands of, of wherever you may be in the world. I feel that that's a very important part of a shift that we're working through, where people have not really understood the land that we're walking on every single day and with the historical context of how we got here and um, the trauma that many people have experienced. I feel like as well, it's connected to all of the things that we're seeing currently with the social, political, ecological, economic challenges, racial challenges, all of these things I feel like are kind of shedding a light in order for us to witness and heal and understand this deeper historical context. And speaking of that domination uh, code and this doctrine of discovery, I feel like there is really a different origin story that many people have not understood and this deeper history to this roots that go way, way back centuries old um, that, you know, it began with, um, well, I understand and appreciate, you know, I, I honor all spiritual paths. The historical context is that it began with the Vatican church and um, these papal bulls that you mentioned um, were issued by these popes in the Vatican. And my dad has been able to translate those directly from Latin to English. And they say um, to conquer, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, pagans, and enemies of Christ, to take all of their lands, possessions, and gold, and put them into perpetual slavery for God, glory, and gold. And so really, just within the context of just the heavy... <laughs> The heaviness of those words as like a decree that this would then you know unleash this onto the planet and how that affects all places that that went out and it really also is a direct line to my dad has a film the doctrine of discovery unmasking the domination code um in that one hour film it's been opening hearts and minds throughout the world and i feel it's very enlightening for people to really see that and say, wow, I had no idea. I've, I've been through graduate school. I've, I've had all these degrees and I've had all this education. How could I not know this history? And it's because I feel, you know, it's history that hasn't been really told or focused upon until now. 
Um, and my dad has been doing that work for 40 years now. So really paving the way for many other people that are, are also speaking about these things. But I feel like this is also painting a very clear picture on that domination dehumanization uh, patterns that are very prevalent in all aspects of our lives today. So I feel like it, you know, it's affecting our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our spirit, our sense of purpose, um, our connection with our families and relationships, our abundance and our impact in our communities and certainly on the planet. Um, but the other side of it, I feel like as well, is that we're working through what I see is very much a spiritual evolution that we're able to have the pendulum swinging from, I feel like at one time we began all people throughout the planet, there was an original spirituality that was based on reverence and a deep understanding with sacred laws that we have still to this day within our indigenous cultures and understanding of this connection with the land and really honoring it as our mother earth. And we don't harm our mother, of course. And so there's a different kind of a mentality that is really based on respect and reverence um, and a deep understanding of what it means to really see um, a way of life that's going to perpetuate life and reverence for future generations going seven generations and beyond or into the future. So I feel like this is part of our shift is really there's a reckoning happening. And I, I think that's a big part of it. There's a lot of darkness and maybe a yin yang kind of a, an energy, like so much is swirling right now. And people are in this kind of chaos and confusion, trying to work through what is happening. There's a lot of finger pointing and divisive kind of, you know, arguments and conversation happening. But I feel like the more that we can connect on this deeper root that is our, our wounding for all peoples throughout the planet. It's not just one person or another person. Yes, we've all been traumatized. And really the root of that is that domination code, that dehumanization, which is really you know about abuse. It's about abuse of the planet and really thinking of nature as commodity. And um, also, you know, people like the fact that the slavery was, you know, built into the whole thing of like coming into the country as it you know began is still to be reckoned with today so these types of things understanding you know the genocide that was committed here and and the original peoples that have been in existence and our free and independent existence from time immemorial and ways of harmony and balance that were upheld for millennia um, that now have been interrupted to such an extent that we're seeing such dramatic, you know, changes with the climate emergency and, and how dire it is that we really make the change. So it's about coming together in a really powerful way and really coming into new awareness and evolution for ourselves. Shauna, in, excuse me, Steve. Before we go, go ahead, Shauna, could you tell people again, because when I watched your father's documentary, uh, that was an incredible eye opener for me. Yeah. Uh, it was a real eye opener. How, again, the title of it and where could they see it? How would they be able to access it? If you could re reiterate that. Yes. Um, so the title of my dad's film is The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code um, by Stephen Newcomb. Is, you know, he's the person that this work for 40 years um, and, and also his book is Pagans in the Promised Land, Decoding the Doctrine of Christian Discovery. And really, you know, helping people to see the clear lines of how this Vatican documents were put out into the world and the countries that were really promoting this as a pattern and way of, of living and, and doing things in the world, operating in the world. And then how that then became the basis of uh, the United States and legal um, applications of, of these doctrine that, that is still in effect today. And that's where people are, their minds are blown and saying, how come I never knew this? How could this be in existence today? How could it never have been questioned? What's happening here? It's like a total new <laughs> reality construction for people. Um, and people can access, we have a Vimeo link now and um, as well uh, DVDs that people can still, if they choose to have it in that form as well. Um, and so that's, that's a way that people can access that. And it is one hour long, it's very powerful. We also like to provide a way for 
uh, organizations or universities, for instance, we put together a Q&A version where people can watch the film and then have a Q&A with us after the film. And that's been, been very powerful as well. Thank you. Good, we'll have, we'll have that posted. Shauna, one of the most shocking things when I, when I listen to your dad and when I, when I watch the movie is that this uh, doctrine of discovery, these papal bulls, this is still being used as established law. The Supreme Court, even in this century, has actually cited the, the doctrine of, of discovery as, as legal precedent. Absolutely, yes. And that's what's very shocking and people have a hard time understanding and, you know, but this is, this is the nature of these things. And, um, you know, they've had certain things that people have thought, oh, well, this is great. We're seeing some changes, but my dad and other legal scholars that he's friends with that work on understanding the deeper nature of, for instance, um, uh, the McIntosh, Johnson versus McIntosh case these um, applications are, are like hidden down deep into the laws. <laughs> so, um, you know, there'll be different cases. For instance, I know my dad is very passionate about the Oak Flat case that's happening with the Apache Nation and uh, sacred lands that they have been, you know, going and talking and saying, we want to really make sure that these lands are protected, but they keep citing this doctrine of discovery. So that's a, a very current application just as of you know 2020 so it's not as though this is something that's all the way back in the past and no longer relevant it's very current today for our indigenous nations and peoples but i feel like for all peoples throughout the planet as well so you know one of the things uh, in addition to the actual physical genocide there's also cultural genocide that's taken place mm -hmm. and so i'm curious uh, in your in your growing up um where did the where did the native tradition fit in for you and how did you uh was it something that you had continually as a child or is it something that you discovered as a young adult um well actually i feel very grateful that you know interestingly um so many of you know our original nations indigenous peoples you know because of this genocide because of the colonial um agenda really I feel like in many ways um, you know our, our great grandfathers were placed into the residential boarding schools or my dad says the boarding schools of domination um, so many of our our great grandfathers our grandmothers and have been you know suffered through abuse and beaten for speaking our traditional languages and not understanding our cultures or ceremonies it, it was an intentional way of taking that away from the families and the children so that they would become more indoctrinated into the uh, colonized culture, I guess, if you will. And so I feel grateful that with my upbringing, I was able to connect not necessarily with my direct line, like our Lenape, where I feel very proud. And I usually say that at the very beginning, I feel really grateful that growing up, I was able to be among indigenous nations and elders from many different cultures, from many different lines and lineages. And that gave me such a grounding and foundational understanding of, of ceremony and you know, the songs and the dance and, and really just understanding the elders um, and their teachings in a really deep and meaningful way. Um, I don't think I really understood that and how profound that was until later in life. Um, but certainly it's, it's affected me in, in a deep way and, and had a very big impact to walk a really spiritual uh, path, I think, from a young age. Maybe that was just me, though, in, in many ways. Um, but yeah, I grew up with traditional people and ceremony as a young child, and I feel grateful for that. I grew up really in a multicultural community as well. I, uh, I want to interject something here because uh, I think it's so important that what you're bringing forth, Shauna, and what needs to be brought into light for so many people. But I think it's important that we expand broader because so many Western European cultural uh, lineage people are going through a period right now of feeling 
shamed uh, and, and that you can't talk about this. So as soon as you start to go into this, how the mistreatment, the genocide that occurred in our nation towards the Indians the, and the slavery issue as it relates to the blacks in particular, obviously, it's like, oh, I'm being beaten up again as a, as a Western. And, and by the way, I'm an eighth uh, Cherokee Indian, an eighth Hispanic, you know, and then and then three quarters uh, Western European and, and half of that being Italian. But it's important for people to understand that the genocide and the slavery that occurred here in North America to the Indians and the Blacks has been going on for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. It happened to the Western Europeans. By It started off, you know, back to the Celtics, what they did and how they totally enslaved, destroyed their culture, et cetera, et cetera. And then the Romans came along and they this did it again. It's been this constant evolution throughout humanity's history, throughout the world, that this has the, been the evolutionary path that we've all shared at different times. And I think it's really hugely important that that is acknowledged up front quickly so that people of all cultures and backgrounds can go, wow. I'm, it's not my people that were these racist, genocidal maniacs. It's been the evolution of all peoples throughout all of history. So now let's acknowledge that, help each other now focus on where we can go from there, which is obviously where we want to get to in the conversation. But I felt it was important to bring that up for our audience's benefit for those people so that they will want to listen further want to be curious of and, and forgive themselves and their ancestors for what happened on North American shores, recognizing that their ancestors were put in the similar position that the Indians and Blacks were at different times in their history before that. Uh, yes, I feel like um, it certainly is, as I was mentioning before, part of this domination, dehumanization pattern that has been they're established before those Vatican documents actually were issued. But I feel like uh, this is part of the different origin story as well, that we're learning this deeper history. But I feel like when we learn history in the course of his story, um, mm -hmm. it, it, I feel like, just paints the picture from where they say civilization began. Yeah. Civilization, yeah. my dad goes into the you know, the roots and, and, you know, he's very much into the roots of language and dissecting all of that. But, um, you know, it's very interesting to see that when you look at the word civilization, it is another word for it would be domination. So that domination culture began where civilization began. So history is only told through the lens of domination and dehumanization, if you look at it in that way. And, and so that pattern perpetuates. And I've, done a lot of research and I have my course, the Reference Code Reset Chainmakers course, and I help people go through a journey of about eight weeks to 10 weeks where we're really looking deep dive into this history and understanding that this is something that is true all around the planet for all peoples. Um, certainly, though, I feel like the reckoning is, is really understanding very much with compassion what has happened because it has not yet been acknowledged. There's been no responsibility taken very, very minimally for the genocide that has happened here in North America, Turtle Island, as we call it, and Abhi Ayala, and certainly with the slavery and all of these things. So I feel like those things are coming to the light in order for people to work through it. That's part of our, it's not a comfortable time, but it is part of our evolution to grow. And I see it's very important also, though, on the other side of that, that people can see as well that it isn't just one group of people. It's going all the way back to those Roman times, to the Greek times, that those narratives and understandings of what it meant to really have civilization and to establish this pattern was something that was being played out all over across Europe. Um, another thing that I talk about is really honoring the sacred feminine as well as the sacred masculine, but 
I see these things that brought about civilization were really bringing about that domination, dehumanization code. And so, you know, declaring these incredible healers and, and people across Europe as witches and the witch trials there, and then bringing that and the um, Inquisition. Those are extremely, you know, terrible accounts of, of, of all of the atrocities that happened across Europe in the name of civilizing, you know, and bringing things into a certain way that, that is known today and the colonization there. And then as it came across the shores to the Americas and what is now known as the Americas, um, to the peoples over here and across the planet with, you know, the transatlantic slave trade. So these are all symptoms, but we're talking about symptoms. So I think the more that we can see the root of things here with that domination, dehumanization root, I think that's really a, a point where we can come together because that is the source of our collective trauma. That's really the, the tap root. I, I want to go a little bit more into the uh, how the reference code emerged out of this. Where did that come from? How did you develop it? And say more about this reference code, because this is kind of the what Charles Eisenstein would call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. We're, we're looking at that uh, as something to hold out in front of us as a possibility. So say more about that. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Like, I just remember having a conversation with my dad and um, really, I feel my spiritual path has been something that has been calling to me since I was a young child, like even four years old. I, I remember having very profound dreams as a four-year-old and um, as an eight-year-old, just kind of like, I see developmental points in my life, 12 years old, and then 13 and, and into my teens, I just was very much into personal development, spiritual development. And um, I think having an understanding of, of that and my own personal growth and working through things, and then also um, having an understanding of what I learned in those indigenous connections with the elders and the ceremonies, and, and also trauma that I've experienced personally. Um, it really just began to um, bring up a lot of questions for me. And I said, and I remember saying to my dad, you know, I see that domination code, it's so clear, but I feel like there's something more here. And it's, it's so much more beyond just the respect. It's this awe and this wonder. And so I just feel that it was, it was part of the spiritual path that I've been on and really a lot of questions about what was happening in the world. And I remember having this conversation with my dad, which we have a lot of long conversations. And, and I said, you know, it seems like the opposite of the domination code is the reverence code. And, um, you know, it's, it's this awe and this wonder for life and um, really this deep spiritual connection that there are no words to even describe. Like we have kind of fleeting moments of that for some people, um, but how can we have an honoring of that as really the way forward and for more people to experience that? Um, and I feel like just having so many people come to the movie showings and seeing my dad's film, um, the awakenings, I could just see people's, the kind of the deer in the headlights. <laughs> people's minds were just blown open and they, and they would come up to me literally pulling my shirt sleeve and saying, I don't know what to do. I never knew this. I, I have to do something. And so I said, Dad, we can't just leave them like that. We have to help them. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. what, can we, what can we offer? And um, I don't know. I, I think it just over several many years, I, I started to come together with like different things that were part of my spiritual path and um, as well as messages that I've received in dreams and connections from the elders. I bring in aspects of my dad's work and that deeper understanding of the language and the history. So I feel like that reverence code is something very much that's a part of everybody and everything everywhere. It's connected to the original teachings that um, the original peoples have known for forever, <laughs> really. Um, but it's coming back to it. I think people are really wanting to revert back to that, sensing that there's something missing uh, since we stopped thinking about seven generations up and seven generations back. And uh, so say more about this, this reverence code. How, 
uh, when you're when you're sharing this with people as part of your your classes or even your personal uh, uh, work with people, how do people bring this into their lives as this new reference code? Um, well, as I mentioned, it's kind of a transformational journey, so there's a lot of steps to it. Um, but I feel like there's, you know, I, I did receive kind of these core foundational teachings that I offer in that. Um, and then people come through a journey of, of really going deep down into the history, as I've kind of been talking about. And then coming out the other side, I feel like it's going into a deeper understanding of the narrative that many people have been taught in school. And I feel like it's a, a path of unlearning just as much as it is learning because there's a lot of unlearning in that decolonization education, I think in many ways that some people have said that, um, where things that we've learned and taken for granted in, in um, the understandings that people have had from schooling, it's, it's actually not having us fully integrate into our spiritual self. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, I feel like that there's sort of this unlearning that needs to happen in order for us to really go deep into the spiritual understanding. And it's part of a personal um, healing journey. And uh, I feel like a personal reckoning in some ways, like going deeper into our own personal work. And then there's also collective work. And I've had people that have come to the course and said, you know, I've spent my whole life being in service and I've just wanted to give to others, but I, I thought it was selfish to focus on myself. And, I, and it's like, oh, but actually you can do so much, you can go so much deeper with the work that you're doing in the world when you go deep within and, and really look into the healing that's there needed within yourself, then you can focus even more on the collective healing too. So I feel like that's where people, people walk through, they're going, understanding the domination code and really deep into that, and then understanding the reverence code and these teachings that are based on the original uh, instructions of our nations and peoples and the indigenous traditions um, throughout the world and, and really understanding that there's a new story, there's a new paradigm. Um, I talk about something called the great shift, which I see is, is on the spiritual side of things, but it's within the collective of everything that we're seeing right now. It's, it's kind of like I see that it's by design in a way that all of these things are coming to the forefront um, the shadows coming to the light in order to be witnessed and healed. And so I, as painful as it is to have all of this coming up at us right now in a way, it's like, okay, look, all the alarm bells are ringing around the planet. It's time for us to make changes, dramatic changes, um, and, and start to look at things in a new way from a different perspective. And if it hasn't been really working the way it's been, you know, for this many centuries, things are dramatically out of balance and off kilter. There are certain shifts that in, in my dad actually gave a talk at the Parliament of World Religions in 2015. And he said to work on climate change without working on a paradigm change would be a grave mistake. And also that um, you know, looking at the patterns of domination and dehumanization, that's been the basis of kind of the world in the way it is, the modern world. And so that's where we really need to focus is really seeing, and there's a personal responsibility and accountability at this time, each and every one of us has to face and, and take and look at. And certainly the governments and organizations and companies and corporations you know, as well, because it, it, we all depend on this. <laughs> it's like, we don't have the luxury of time anymore. It's beyond the 11th hour. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's time to come together in these different ways and understandings. Shauna, something that you, uh, you wrote a note from Shauna Blue Star Newcomb on your website and, and the opening of it, there's something I wanted to, to comment on. What you said there, in today's world, we've been conditioned to believe in limitations and lack, and that magic isn't real, miracles aren't possible, or that success is only for a select few. And then going on a little bit, you said, it's time to see life and the world from a new perspective, and what truly is possible for you. 
And I think that's an important point that you're making about limitations. And it reminded me of a, of a Japanese proverb that was recently brought to me that I think is, is perfectly in keeping with, with where we are right now and in what you just said uh, about the need to expand our perspectives. And this Japanese proverb is, the frog in the well knows nothing of the sea. And this proverb is about the limits of experience and how those limits limit us. And it calls us to get out into the world and expand our consciousness, expand our thinkings. And that's when we can really begin to find solutions and, and find new perspectives and create that holistic, more holistic view that then we can begin to accept each other in new ways, bring new spirituality into the world and love and compassion for each other. And together we can stand shoulder to shoulder and arm to arm to begin dealing with these significant challenges of our time, like climate derangement, which I prefer that word, uh, and, and, the, and the root causes of so many issues that we face today. Uh, so I'd like you to, to continue to comment uh, further on this reverence code. And because and, what you're talking about is, what can I do? And you break it down very specifically about what can I do uh, and how to help people see a way forward so that they can contribute to the change. Uh, I, I think it's interesting. Sometimes I, I forget what I put out there. And <laughs> We're all so, like that. Uh, yes, a good reminder of what was on my website. Thank you. Um, but, and I, I feel that I definitely, I, you know, this is part of my life work, I think. Um, you know, I very much feel that it's about coming into our possibilities, our infinite possibilities. And, you know, in some ways that schooling that people have had has been definitely pointing to a, a place of lack. Um, I don't know, there's a, there's a mental conditioning that happens where people feel that they are not their possibilities. People are, you know, just in trauma with self-doubt and um, competition is is what people are really you know feeling like oh I've got to compete I've got to um, you know look a certain way do all these things in a certain way because it's the conditioning again it's this domination dehumanization world that's all we're swimming in it we're swimming in that in those waters um, and people are and I've talked about this that people think well something just doesn't feel right but we turn that internally and we think that that something is wrong with me but I say often, you know, what if it's not that there's something wrong with me or you, it's that there's something wrong with society. And <laughs> maybe we should start there. Like, you know, that like, let's really look at what waters we're swimming in. Um, what has this, and, and, and things like, you know, we tell children, well, don't brag about yourself. Well, don't say that how smart you are. Well, you know, don't see how beautiful you are, you know, it's like, but then, oh, it's okay to say, I look like crap today, you know, like, why these things are up, we're living in an upside down world that's crazy making, and it doesn't make sense when you really start to have critical thinking and say, yeah, why is it like this? How did it get set up like that? And, but yet we're turning that internally, or pointing fingers at others, it's, it's my fault, or it's your fault. Well, let's look at what's really, but how did it get like this? It was a setup. It's set up this way. <laughs> and so, how can we start to yeah. create a new story and a new visioning and really see our possibilities? Because I feel like the spiritual path that is so beautiful and so profound is that we have innate superpowers. We have intuition and incredible guidance with us on a spiritual level that was cut off from us. It's like cutting off our root. And that's the reverence code. And at one time before pre-civilization, there's not a lot of, of you know, focus on pre-civilization because it's like, oh, those Neanderthals and those stupid non-civilized barbarian people, you know, that's the narrative. And what if that is the beauty and the magic of where things really are, that how we can get back into balance, how we can bring 
the solutions and innovative ways that people are like, if only we had the magic formula. Well, we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just been like thrown in the garbage for, for eons now. Um, so it's bringing it back and the pendulum is swinging. I feel like we started actually in the reverence code and then it, it slowly, slowly, slowly started to infect this original virus of the domination code. And that became the way of things that was the normal. And now we're being called to come back to the reverence code and that's the future. You said something there about, you referenced how people refer to people of the past as barbarians and et cetera, because they're comparing only that which is made through technology and through the modern technology and science. And so anybody who didn't have those kind of, of computers and, and look at how advanced we are, and yet those people that they're referring to as barbarians and savages, they were really truly connected on much higher levels of spirituality to the, to the land uh, and to each other. Uh, they offered us so much learning that we've forgotten. Think about the, I go back to many times to the debates of, of the slave debates with Lincoln and, and Stevens. They would people, hundreds and hundreds of people dressed in wool garments in the middle of the summer, in the middle of, of the Midwest would stand for three hours listening to a debate by two people on one subject. We can't get beyond a tweet. We can't get beyond a, if it takes more than three minutes, people's you know, level of concentration goes away and we think we're smart. I go back and read my father's papers written in 1920 something in high school. And those would be better than most college level papers today. The level of vocabulary, et cetera. People think we're so advanced We've gone the opposite direction in almost every single measurable way, except what technology has been able to create, produce, to surround us with stuff. Yes. Pat yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> and that's obviously that uh, in, in picking up on that, how do we break the trans? You know, we've been uh, our our so-called civilization, and by the way, that's another word that your your dad has helped deconstruct to civilize civilize those savages. That's how that word has been used. So again, in this relearning process, uh, we've been called a a taker civilization where we we extract and exploit. How do we break that trans? And I I how do we break that trans individually and collectively? And what signs do you see that that this is actually an opening for us now. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. Well, I've often said that our smartphones are not smart. You know, they they have the autocorrect, for instance, is, is always causing all kinds of problems and misunderstandings. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, technology is not always helping us. Um, I mean, there are, there are benefits, but certainly a lot of challenges. Um, I think that part of that too, though, is, is interesting, like, I, you know, ask people that I work with in my courses and, and my clients, like, have you scheduled nothing today? Um, you know, these are the things that people are so hyper, like multitasking and they cannot stop looking at their phones and they've got all kinds of notifications and, um, you know, it, there's no space to just be. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest challenges to begin with. It's like, how can people just breathe? How can people just decompress? Um, I feel like that's like just sitting still. Um, that's one of the really beautiful um, unlearning things to, to focus on first. And I often talk about getting into nature. So I feel like, you know, just coming into a sense of stillness which is not part of the modern day culture to be still, to be quiet. These are things that are not valued in you know, the modern culture. It's kind of like, if you're just sitting still and being quiet, there's something wrong with you. Like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you? <laughs> or if you're like off of social media for like a day or two, are they okay? What's wrong with them? Where are they kind of, you know, so these, they just, there's a different way um, a quietness, a, 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 a softer way, a softer approach to life that I think is missing. Um, and that reverence, just coming even, even sitting, if you're, you know, 
coming into a city park, you could be in the city, but you have that moment. It doesn't have to, I don't really say that it has to be that people go into meditation for hours and have this whole, certainly they can. Um, I feel like it's just simple practices. That's what I encourage that can bring people into more alignment and balance. That is part of this relearning to connect to ourselves, to a spiritual connection. Um, I think without that, that's part of that um, centering that's needed for people to really start to, to feel what it's like to come into the reverence code. If they are just full of busyness, they can't have the same connection at all. That connection with the land, the more that people can be on the land, mm -hmm. like actually sleeping on um, the ground, you know, walking barefoot, like these kinds of things that people have, you know, for the time it was like, oh, you know, you don't go barefoot. Well, you've got to wear shoes. You've got, you know, it's kind of like these very kind of simple things that people have taken for granted, just connecting with the land in that way. It, it energy, I mean, it's scientifically proven. I, I like to look at quantum physics and I, I geek out on that stuff too, because I'm like, yay, it's actually describing the scientific basis behind so much of the spiritual understanding that ancient peoples have known for so long. If you need the science to somehow back it up, but it works, <laughs> you just go in and you connect and it's beautiful. Our slogan is it works in practice, but does it work in theory? <laughs> <laughs> so good that science is proving what these people have known for you know, deck, uh, many thousands of years. Yeah. Michael, do you have any, do you have something uh, else you want to ask? Because I've got a, a couple of questions here. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that has been lacking and why we've gotten in off track for so long has been the domination by the male, the masculinity. And one of the most essential things to bring us back into balance uh, is the uh, rising of the feminine side of humanity. And you have a, a, a course even in that and a program coming up called Sacred Feminine Rising. And that is so, so hugely important if we're going to achieve a new balance with life uh, and move beyond where this places that we're stuck in, it has to be when we can achieve a new balance between the masculine and the feminine. Can you uh, elaborate on your course, the sacred feminine rising and, and, and help us understand this? Yes. Um, well, I appreciate you bringing that to attention as well. Um, I feel that, you know, this is part of that deeper wounding where, that domination code, um, I, you know, in my own research, my dad is definitely a researcher, and I think I am to an extent as well. And, you know, just, I think I had this burning desire to understand, well, how did it get like this? How far back does it go? And I started to look into a lot of the history of the Inquisition and the witch trials and um, you know, I have had and endured my own personal challenges through an abusive relationship for a time. And, um, you know, I just didn't understand, like, how could this happen? How, you know, what is, what is wrong with the world that, that these things could be so um, common? You know, there's so much rampant abuse throughout the planet. And uh, there has been, you know, certainly directed towards women, directed towards the feminine. Um, and so I started to look at that and really see that it was also something that was in the, in the civilization of, of things. I, I looked at something called Hammurabi's Code. Um, it was the first time that law was written in stone, literally like chiseled into stone. And, um, you know, these laws about how the men were to treat the women um, and this kind of the hierarchy. So the, the modeling and the domination code is higher than less than superior, inferior, um, and kind of like this condemnation for others is built into it. And so, you know, in the beginning, I see that there was a shift, that it went from women being on the altar, women were sacred, women were seen as these incredible, sacred, magical beings, because we can birth babies, we can bring life, 
And, you know, that was on the altar at one time and you can see it on the ancient artworks and it's, it's incredible. Um, and then it's a shift. There's a shift even in the artwork where it starts to become about men on horseback and there's swords and this gore and this violence is then glorified and put on the altar. So I see that's a very big shift in how things began to change. And certainly the women that were midwives and healers and having intuitive understandings and knowings about things, you know, that was, that was vilified. And um, there were men as well, but mostly, you know, the women that were the women's Holocaust all across Europe for thousands of years and uh, the trauma within families, I'm sure the trauma within men that couldn't protect the women, um, you know, all of these things were patterns that were perpetuating for centuries. And I feel like we're still in a time of reckoning around that. The Me Too movement has been such a big, huge reckoning with, with accountability and responsibility and calling things to attention to say, this can no longer happen. We cannot have the life go on this way. Um, so part of my course is really looking at things again in a similar way to my reverence code course. How can women come together in a powerful sisterhood? That's another part of our healing is healing the sister wound that we're not against each other because that has been something that was perpetuated and set up too. That women, you know, like are competing against each other or, you know, they say cat fights and all of this. It's just, it's toxic. It's all over the, you know, internet. <laughs> um, how can we heal in this way? And also it's not about saying, oh, those bad men either. It's about saying, oh my gosh, this is the focus of how it was set up with that domination code. And how can we heal and how can we see and honor that sacred masculine as well as the sacred feminine? Because that's the part of the evolution as well right now with the great shift is, is the two walking together in a really balanced way. And that's how we also heal the planet and future for, for future generations. And I, I feel like it's honoring women in our spiritual connections, um, just every aspect of our lives. So it's, it's walking with women in sisterhood for a whole year and really coming through a deep transformational and coming into their possibilities of, of what they're bringing for their purpose in the world. You know, what's interesting is that that balance is so essential in every aspect of life when you have balance, you become so much more. Instead of the sum of one plus one equals two, two connected balanced souls become far greater than two. Uh, uh, like my partner, Steve, he's and I, we're so different. And yet together we expand on each other. And, 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 and you look at that in all relationships, all athletics, all families. Two children having a boy and a girl, they bring the best of, out of both and they balance to each other. And, and you look around in, in nature and throughout life and it's, yeah. it's that way. And we lost that and we've got to come back into balance. Definitely. I feel like it's also about honoring that within ourselves that, that we all have aspects of the feminine and the masculine and really mm -hmm. coming into a balance with that within ourselves and each other, I think, is, is part of the, the learning as well and growing. Yeah. You know, so much about so much of quote unquote political activism in our in our lifetime has been about, we would call it transactional. Fix this thing. Yeah, let's let's raise the minimum wage and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, activism has been considered a very uh, pragmatic and non-spiritual thing. And what you're bringing back in is this fundamental idea of our connection with whatever that divine love, whatever that spirit is. And in our current so-called civilization, in the dominant paradigm of scientific materialism, there is the pervasive belief that only the physical world is real. Yeah. And that seems like a real, a real barrier right now. How do we, how do we help people emerge from that I, I guide them to really pay attention to their dreams um, and synchronicities. A lot of people just say, well, that's just a coincidence and they blow it off. But these are some of the uh, spiritual understandings and ways of, of working in the world, walking in the world in a different way, just honoring that there's 
magic in the world. There's awe and there's wonder and there's incredible joy and bliss the more that we start to pay attention to these things and not just dismiss it. Um, so that's part of, I think, maybe um, an introduction, if you will, to it doesn't have to be part of, you know, some religious thing. It, it can be your own unique individual connection to whatever that spiritual way and path is. And I feel like that's unique for each person. Um, but I think that's a good way to begin is just really paying attention to our dreams and um, connecting with nature. These are simple things, as I said, that can really bring a lot of meaning for people to begin. This is a really interesting way of actually uh, establishing true power because you don't have to go through an intermediary. You don't need some kind of a spiritual intermediary. I mean, that's the secret that each of us can have that connection. Uh, so that's really uh, that's really very very powerful way of looking at the future. Uh, also, I'm very curious uh, to get more about your vision. Some of the things that you see, particularly as we want to have. Uh, we, there's so many dystopian visions out there of where we can go. It dominates our consciousness. And so we like to television, turn off your TV, television instead. And so uh, I'm, what, what is your, uh, what would this look like, this, uh, this reference code uh, established? What would it be like? What would it feel like? And what do you see? Um, I'll definitely, I can share a bit more about what I have received in terms of messages and dreams and I feel like um, a part of it as well there's a lot of native prophecies that talk about these times that we kind of become coming into this time of this swirling energy um, part of it is what we choose and 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 we I feel like we very much are powerful in our co-creating and what's possible for the future and I, I love what you just said which I really want to emphasize as well that it is that direct connection um, because that original severing that I described and that, you know, coming into the domination code, it was severing our direct connection. And it was saying, no, those people are heretics and those people, you know, they're, they're bad. The mystical people were some, somehow like, you know, witches and, and not to be trusted because they weren't connected in some way to, to these other oh, the powerful beings are only, you know, the people in the churches and don't listen to anybody, anybody that says differently, they're a witch. Um, so these are the things that it's like a repair and it, it is very antiquated. I feel like how can people still, like, why would we still hold that? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. of course we have our own spiritual connection. That's, we are that as beings here on this, you know, in this world. So I feel like part of it is, is understanding ourselves in a deeper way. Um, the prophecies talk about a time where we would go through a great shaking. I feel like the shaking is urging us to wake up and urging us to come back into balance um, for ourselves and for the planet and the, all beings on the planet, but for the future as well. And um, I receive a lot of messages, which I wasn't always comfortable sharing, you know, uh, for many years, I could not at all. But the more that I just felt like I, I actually understood that more elders and Native people were sharing messages and other people from around the world as I went to festivals. And so I felt like, oh, well, this is just what's happening right now. This is people receiving visions, receiving dreams, receiving messages, because it's what needs to be heard. It feels like it's amplified for the healing of, of what's happening right now. So I can share some of a message if you'd like as well. Sure, please. Okay. Um, well, it's a very profound message, but I feel like part of this as well is um, learning to walk in a new way, learning to um, kind of, like I mentioned, coming through this evolutionary piece of, of really looking at the reckoning and what we've been, the trauma, the collective trauma, the personal trauma that we all carry from that domination, dehumanization, from the, the patterns that were unleashed with that doctrine of discovery that are still in effect today and coming into a new awareness of those magical powers that I kind of said on my website message, you know, like we're not limitation and lack. We are so much more. There's so much more beyond than even our comprehension of what is possible for us and for the future. And so it's looking with the eyes and vision of, of true infinite possibilities. And I think that is, is it's, it's empowering, it's inspiring. And I hope the message inspires you as well. 
But um, so I received this message and sometimes it's funny, I'll just be cleaning. <laughs> This mm -hmm. sounds really strange, but this happened. So um, here's the message I received and I have to write it down. And then I'm just reading to you what I wrote down, but it's not, I don't feel that this is me. I feel like this is much bigger than me. Um, so my message is called a new direction. And I do have these on my website, the great shift messages, messages. Um, and I have several of these that are on recording. Now once more, people come to this new way of being with lightness in their heart and a sense of renewal. This is when things truly begin to shift. This is when more and more people begin to feel there is something happening and the messages begin to spread and more people will begin to wake up to what they felt was missing before. They will let go of past angers, hatreds, hurts, and sorrows and begin anew. This is a new time of renewal and to celebrate that there is indeed a shift. This is a time of coming together and support and community, and people will begin to see the error in their ways. This is a truly powerful time. Next, we see that people find it less and less appealing to be in a world with chaos or violence or fighting, and their hearts really open up in a new way. This is when things start to shift on a large scale, and people come together to make big changes. There is no tolerance for hate, bigotry, slaughtering, hunting for sport racism and all of the isms and ignorant choices that come from fear in the world. Suddenly there is a new ideal for coming together and not about fighting the separateness. This is a new time of deep acceptance for differences and a realization of oneness on a bigger scale. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. It's really powerful and powerfully true. <laughs> I, I feel like we are so lucky to be living at this time so that we can help in this transformation from a world of separation to an age of reunion so that we can truly begin to come together as people. Uh, and when we come together, the solutions will be found for these significant challenges of our frontiers. And we're on the cusp of that, and we have that opportunity. And old guys like Steve and I, and many, many, many others are hopefully helping connect a bridge uh, of our life's wisdom that we have brought to the next generations and pass on to, to you what we've learned to add, because it's it's through that passing on of, of each level of consciousness that we stand on the shoulders of the generations before us uh, so that we can see a new way forward. So we can be those frogs to get out of that well and not allow those limitations that have been built up around us by others to continue to stand there between us and the infinite possibilities that humanity has and what uh, our creator has brought forth through us. Definitely. I do see it's time for us to spread our wings, so to speak, learn that we have wings. Yeah. <laughs> it's the caterpillar to butterfly moment to spread our wings and see our possibilities and the magic. So yeah. definitely. <laughs> time for the eagle and the condor to fly together again. Yes. Yeah. Steve, do you want to have any last question you want to ask? Otherwise, I guess we're kind of reaching the end of our time. And yeah, I, I and I think what what you just said, Shauna, would be the is is actually the perfect wrap up uh, for for the for this interview. Um, I I think I'm complete with this. I think we've covered a lot, um, and I think people will be inspired by it. We are so you know we're going to put the links at the bottom, and we also have uh, we're on Facebook. And we also have a YouTube. We're so happy that we were able to do this and we're, we're looking forward to a long-term connection in uh, continuing to help to spread the word about what you're up to. Thank you. Do you mind if I say my website one more time? Like how You can say it? your website one more time, yes. Okay, so um, <laughs> thank you. I just wanna say thank you to both of you and um, it's been a pleasure having this conversation. I hope people find inspiration and. You can connect with me at shaunabluestar.com and find me on social media at shaunabluestar, Newcom or shaunabluestar.com. Shauna, I can't thank you enough. Uh, 
uh, I'm, I was so looking forward to this conversation and uh, I only wish we had more time, but uh, I do invite our audience uh, to follow Front and Center. Uh, as Steve mentioned on our YouTube channel, we've got a Facebook page. We're brand new. We've just started building our community. We hope that you will, will come and support us. Hopefully you can subscribe so that we can continue to pay our rent and continue our work. Uh, so from political battlefields to cooperative playing fields, it's a long journey. Let us go there together. Thank you.